Tawag kang manluho mo Sa sinapit na kalagahayan Tagapagsilbi, tagasunod sa utos Nang lalaking sumumpang ibibigay sa iyo ang buwan Rebecca, wag kang manluho mo sa sinapit na kalagahayan Daigdig mo'y apat na dingdingay ay Hapong hapo, kailan ang kapahingan? Humayo ka na beheka Luha mo'y pandilik sa binhi ng Sayaw ng katarungan Humayo ka na behe ka Luha mo'y pandilik sa binhi ng kalayaan Humayo ka na behe ka Umindahiyog sa sayaw ng katarungan Rebecca, wag kang manluho mo Humayo ka Rebecca Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Arian Oligario, Gender Equality and Social Inclusion Advisor, and I will be your moderator for today. This webinar is organized by the Earth Journalism Network, a program of the media development organization Internews. Earth Journalism Network, or EJN, has a mission to improve quality and quantity of journalism on environment. And it does this by helping journalists like you to report on climate change, diversity and conservation, population, and other environment issues by providing story grants, trainings, fellowships. EJN is a community. It's a community of more than 14,000 journalists across 180 countries. And if you're not a member yet, and you'd like to be one, please visit earthjournalism.net to register. And by registering, you'll be the first to hear about story grants, fellowships, and events like this webinar. It is such an honor to be with everyone as we launch EJN's IDEA Talk. IDEA stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Environment News Reporting. IDEA Talks will be held quarterly and is a platform to share relevant information on environment news that is inclusive and diverse. And it will also showcase equitable and accessible solutions. This is a formative talk in which each of the presenters is given a 10-minute presentation with a specific outline on research data, local experiences, highlighting the marginalized voices, and even personal experiences by our expert presenters in various thematic field and environment and its intersection with sex, genders, disability, economic status, race, ethnicity, and age. This is the first in the IDEA Talk series. And what an opportune time to launch it during the International Women's Month. And this talk, exploring the income, the impact of climate change and women, will focus on the intersection of climate change and women. And we have two amazing presenters working in Asia Pacific and the Philippines, both climate change experts. Our topics will revolve on women in multi-hazard environment in the Philippines, and the impact of climate change in the increasing number of gender-based violence, such as intimate partner relationships. So those are two of, two of our main talks, but again, some house rules. For your questions, please use the Q&A feature in the bottom of the Zoom. This is what we will be monitoring throughout this session. 
unfortunately, we'll be we will not be um, monitoring the chat, so please use the Q&A button. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to rewatch this or catch other parts that you have missed. We will open this up in the next few days and attendees will receive an email to watch it. And without further ado, I am very excited to introduce our first speaker who will share her experiences responding to multi-hazard environment in the Philippines. The Philippines is one of those countries that suffer most from extreme weather events. The Climate Risk Index by German Watch ranked the Philippines fourth in the long-term impact of climate change. And because of its particular vulnerability, being a poor country and the monetary losses is greater compared to richer countries. So how does this work out when there are multiple hazards experienced by the population, experienced by the women? Let me introduce our first speaker, DG or Divina Gracia, who will share with us her experience in handling gender inclusive humanitarian responses in multi hazard environment in the Philippines, which is affected by climate change and man made conflict. She brings with her over a decade of experience in humanitarian development nexus, resilient livelihood, and climate change. Turning it over to you now, Deej. Thank you, Ariane, and um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. So, um, let me just share my screen before I start. So for today, I will talk about, uh, kindly tell me if it's visible. Is it? Give me a thumbs up. All right, I think it's visible. Your silence means yes. Okay, so um, for this talk, I'll be, uh, discussing climate change and rural women in the Philippines. So climate change affects each person disproportionately. The story I will tell is about the experiences of Filipino women, their struggle with climate change, and how they are trying to adapt, if not rise, from this challenge. There. So just a quick background about the Philippines. The Philippines has been ranked first in the world RIC risk index in 2022. Um, it's an index measuring disaster risk, while it ranked 17th in the global climate risk index in 2021. So it is an archipelagic country in this uh, Southeast Asia located in both the Pacific Ring of Fire and Typhoon Belt, and it has three main islands, Luzon, um, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And due to its uh, geography, it is highly exposed to various hazards, both geological, um, like volcanic eruptions, tsunami, and earthquakes, and hydrometeorological, those hazards related to weather, such as typhoons, flooding, dry spells, and drought. So almost always, these hazards turn into disasters due to the vulnerability of communities and their lack of adaptive capacity. So, um, usually, um, areas that are high risk um, are those that have uh, low adaptive capacity and high vulnerability. So, because of high exposure and frequency of events, people have been so used to these hazards that turned into disasters, especially since typhoons pass through the country 20 times a year on average. So climate change has changed the nature of hazards and have exacerbated um, disasters that are already being experienced. So for decades, typhoons enter the southeastern part of the Philippines, usually making landfall in the Bicol region, in the island of Luzon, or in the island of summer or late in the Visayas. And it exits um, in the northwestern part of the country, particularly in the island of Batanes, which is also in Luzon. So people in these areas have already adapted to its adverse effects, thereby decreasing the possibility of disasters. So this means that the island of Mindanao is almost always spared. But beginning to mid to late 2000s, 
um, things have changed. Because of climate change, typhoons have been forming in the Pacific even in the latter months of the year. So during the usual rainy season, also the usual typhoon season from June to September, typhoons take the same route from the southeast to the northwest traversing Visayas and Luzon. But in the recent decade, especially during the months of October to December, Typhoons diverge from their usual path, making landfall in the islands of Visayas to the northern part of the island of Mindanao. Um, usually, it brings with them torrential rainfall, resulting to flooding and rain-induced landslides. So remember that typhoons in these areas are not a regular occurrence, so communities have not le learned to adapt yet as much as their neighbors in uh, Luzon and Visayas. And because they are not as prepared, disasters were inevitable. Uh, beginning year 2011, when Typhoon Washi locally named Sendong made landfall in the Philippines, strong typhoons passed through the island of Mindanao. And ever since, it has been a regular occurrence. So Typhoon Washi was followed by Typhoon Bofa in 2012, uh, tropical Storm Jangmi in 2014, Typhoon Tembin in 2017, and recently Typhoon Rai or Odette, uh, locally known as Odette in 2021. Sometimes when typhoons do not exactly landfall in Mindanao, they pull in strong winds and heavy rainfall that cause severe flooding and landslides just as Tropical, tropical Storm Nalje in 2022. So these are the... Um, effects of climate change. According to 2018 projections of the Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration, or PAGASA, there is an increasing trend in the frequency of strong typhoons in the Philippines, coupled by increasing trends in annual and seasonal rainfall that could translate to more flooding and rain-induced landslides. On the other hand, scientists have projected stronger and more frequent El Nino events that will result in increased incidences of drought. So, as I said, climate change affects each person disproportionately, and rural women experience its impacts differently from other sectors of society. So, in my years as a development worker, um, I have been involved in reconstruction and rehabilitation efforts of agricultural-based livelihoods, usually working with rural women, especially those whose sources of income have been affected by Typhoon Haiyan in Panay Island, specifically in the provinces of Antique and Iloilo, and Typhoon Tembin in the 2018-19 to El Nino event in the Bangsamoro region, particularly in the province of Lanao del Sur and Maguindanao. So from what I saw, the main effect of climate change can be felt in women's livelihoods and their families' access to food. Uh, women in these areas are usually vegetable gardeners or employed as farmhands for fertilizer application and weeding. They are not landowners and they do not usually own assets such as farming or gardening tools and equipment. Um, these are almost always owned by men. So aside from this, there is limited availability of seasonal employment for women. Unlike their male counterparts, rural women cannot easily shift to other um, sources of income or alternative livelihoods like uh, carpentry or masonry and the public utility driving, uh, those that uh, drive the tuk-tuk or tricycle as it is called in the Philippines. Um, also, um, they do not have ready access to financing in case they would like to open a small business. So the lack of ownership, lack of alternative livelihoods, and lack of access to financing increases the vulnerability of rural women to climate change because they are not as um, adaptive. So um, they lack the adaptive capacity. And so when adverse effects of climate change strike, usually in the form of typhoons, severe flooding or drought, this almost always usually mean crop failure for rural women. Lesser harvests mean lesser incomes. Lesser incomes mean lesser food on the table. This gives undue stress to women who are invariably tasked with the budgeting and cooking food for the household. And speaking of stress, water stress is also experienced by women, especially in bouts of dry spells or drought, which has become more frequent as an effect of climate change. So as vegetable gardeners, um, most of the women I have worked uh, with 
are um, have small plots of land where they um, plant vegetables. So they still use watering cans to um, water their vegetable plots. And so when water is scarce, it becomes a challenge to them since they need to find alternative water sources when the one nearest them dries up. So women are required to walk long distances to get water for their plots, adding to their hardship. When water is lacking, harvests are unsure, and so is their income and access to food. In areas where there is conflict, as in the Bangsamoro region, so the Bangsamoro region is a place in the Philippines where there has been um, violent conflict since the 1970s due to the um, objective of the Bangsamoro people to gain autonomy. So in this region, women are faced with, multi with multiple hazards or multi-hazards, that of violent conflict and disasters exacerbated by climate change. So in the municipality of Mamasapan na Maguindanao, women and their families have experienced displacement not only because of severe, severe flooding, but also because of ongoing firefight between government forces and the Bangsamoro Islamic freedom fighters. So these layers of disasters have affected various aspects of women's lives from their livelihood to the education of their children, especially because they have experienced displacement. And um, it has been an ongoing or protracted crisis. So however, this does not mean that women are helpless. Women from Sigay no Mga Babay, an all-women organization based in Datu Saudi Ampatuan, Maguindanao, have made innovations for their vegetable garden that will protect their plots from flooding and will allow them to evacuate their crops during conflict. Um, you may see uh, these on the pictures on the next few slides where they have used empty water gallon bottles or um, used rice sacks to plant vegetables. So uh, this is the example. Um, as journalists, um, you are called to make the plight of women known and to increase awareness on the specific needs of women in adapting to the adverse effects of climate change. Um, the second challenge is for you to highlight innovations. So it is important for you to document not only the impacts of climate change on women, but also highlight innovations they have made in order to adapt. The significant contributions of women in climate action, particularly in adaptation, should be underscored. By doing so, best practices of women in climate action can be replicated by women or men from other communities. And lastly, um, as journalists, the challenge is to empower women. Women have long been portrayed as helpless victims, but as I have witnessed, they have an important role to play in climate action, and these should be emphasized. So that's it. Um, you can uh, search these links to view the resources that I have used, and this will also help you with um, your news writing, hopefully. Thank you. That's it from my end. Thank you so much, DG. Thank, thank you, you for, for your time. That. Yes, thank you for sharing. And thank you for highlighting the need to bring in the stories of the women and their experiences, especially in communities wherein women have very low adaptive capacities. And once we begin to share those strategies, women can begin to also be inspired and also learn new ways to adapt. Thank you. Thank you so much, DG. The United Thanks, Nations. Thanks, Ayan. Thanks, everyone. Yep. The United Nations on Environment estimates that 80% of people who will be displaced by climate change globally will be women. This is a huge number. And this huge number reflects the negative impact that women will face in midst of the climate change. It can be the lack of that adaptive capacity mentioned by DG. It can also increase trafficking in women and increase even gender-based violence. Our next expert is Ritu. Ritu is a team leader and principal researcher of the Inter International Institute for Environment and Development, or IIED. She will share the re research that she has been leading on the impact of climate change and in the increase of gender-based violence. With her 18 years of senior policy development, research and management experiences in government, funding agencies, and international NGOs, Ritu has extensively worked on social protection, climate resilience, both in policy, planning, and financing, forest and water, watershed management, resource conservation, may it be water and energy, through renewables and circular economy. 
She also worked in livelihood and gender issues. So Ritu, please take it away. Thank you so much, Ariane, for that introduction. So uh, I actually didn't want to waste too much time. Uh, so I hope my presentation is visible to everybody. So uh, it has already kind of set the tone uh, because, uh, you know, well, of course, we need to see women as being more empowered and not being as a helpless uh, person. But, you know, our research has shown that their conditions, their social and institutional norms, uh, they are the ones that create individually, they are quite uh, leaders within themselves, but you know, those social and institutional norms, they create vulnerability for them. So I'll be talking more about how climate change is leading to forced displacement and distress migration and what impact it creates on women. Uh, and, you know, I normally talk about my research around the way it creates uh, vulnerability around uh, modern slavery, trafficking, but today I'll also briefly cover the health-related impacts and the, uh, and, and the mental trauma and the anxiety and the stress it creates for women. Uh, so quickly, just because, you know, a previous speaker has talked about this, what we really need to understand that the climate change has changed in the way it used to behave earlier. In the recent times, in the last four or five years especially, we have seen that there are those climate extremes like change to which we were able to adapt, we are not able to do that anymore. It's breaching our limits to coping capacity. And this is because many of these climatic events are being unprecedented uh, extremes. You know, everyone, media really covered uh, the Pakistan floods in a big way. One third of the country was underwater. How can you ever adapt or cope with, a, uh, with, a, with an event like that? How can you ever prepare in advance for an event like that? And similarly, you know, uh, I remember Assam floods last year were also un unprecedented because it occurred at a time in India when it never occurs. And floods occurred in, in late May, in late July again. So it was not just un unprecedented extreme, it was too unprecedented extreme. So you're hardly able to recover from one and you are hit by another and then by another. And people, you know, journalists who are uh, today from the region understand that in the Bay of Bengal, uh, we used to receive one cyclones in two years. I remember growing up in that area. But now we receive two or e even three cyclones in one year, which is like, how do you cope with those? You know, our, our infrastructure, our systems, our institutions, our delivery mechanism, they're not tuned with dealing with that kind of uh, disaster, or that scale of impact. So people in these areas are in perpetual recovery mode. I actually, I recently spent five weeks in field and I just returned back. And, you know, one thing that everybody told me, you know, when you go and interact with community, they said drought or flood, you know, they're in many areas from the places where I do research, it's, it's like a regular annual event. And many of you journalists would also know that, you know, in many regions in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and all these areas, Floods and cyclones and drought, these are like regular phenomena. How has, it, how has climate change really changed it? The way it has changed it, it has become much more difficult. It has become larger in magnitude. It has increased in frequency. So people were able to deal with one drought uh, in three or four years. They, will, they were able to cope with it. They were able to recover from the financial loss of crop. But if the same financial impact of crop loss starts happening every year, then they go into that debt, sp debt spiral and they're not able to recover from that vicious cycle. So that's why it is important to recognize that the, it's the same, same drought, same cyclone, the same flood. It's different now. It's because of climate change. And to understand how it is creating, and, and especially when I say it's becoming unprecedented in both extremes and frequency, it's breaching the existing coping capacity. It's going beyond limits of coping capacity. And that is when loss and damage occurs. Loss in lives, livelihood, uh, infrastructure, which in many times they are quantified in terms, uh, in, in monetary terms, and they are normally tagged as economic loss and damage. But there are other non-economic loss and damage, things like mental stress, things like uh, uh, forced displacement, distress migration, which never gets captured in any planning process. It, you know, nobody cares about it because you know, it's, it cannot be monetized, so nobody cares about it. And therefore, it, you know, it goes unnoticed. 
and people are left to fend or deal with those non-economic loss and damage themselves. So what we tried to do, we, 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 we did this assessment and the other problem with this research in the space is much of the evidence originates from Global North. So a lot of, uh, and I'm nothing against uh, researchers in Global North. In fact, I'm myself based in London. But the problem happens is, you know, when Northern researchers go and try to research in, this, in Global South, quite often they're not able to understand the context. You know, how is climate, what's, what is the reality of this loss and damage, especially in terms of non-economic loss and damage? How is it really impacting them? Uh, what are their coping capacity? What are the gaps within them? And to understand or unpack some of these, uh, you know, evidence from Global South, we engaged with the universities in Global South, we engaged with the experts, think tanks, in these, in, 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 in the countries, in based out of countries, and help them, you know, we worked as mentors and peer learning a support group to do this case studies in 12 geographies. And if you look at those locations, we try to cover uh, Asia, Pacific, uh, and, and Africa to understand, like, is climate impact, is that climate change loss and damage different in different contexts? Uh, is it, is slow onset, rapid onset creating different types of impact? And if so, how? And one thing, there are two trends that really emerged out of uh, research, and that was irrespective of geographies, whether it was Africa, Asia, Pacific, and irrespective of whether it was slow onset or rapid onset. And I need to explain what slow onset and rapid onset is because I know many of you are journalists. Slow onset would typically include events like, which occur slowly, for example, drought, desertification, sea level rise, uh, salination, they are typically categorized as slow onset event and they're rapid onset events like heat wave, floods, cyclones. Uh, so irrespective of whether they were facing slow onset or rapid onset event, two trends were common across these geographies. And one was post displacement and distress migration. So in every context, this happened. And we found that those who were displaced or were undertaking distress migration, the ones who were most marginalized the ones who were most poor were the ones who were becoming exposed to becoming victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. And then it was also creating physical health, mental health and well-being issue. And here I need to tell you that uh, it's not just economic and non-economic loss and damage. It goes much beyond that. And I'll explain how it is uh, in, in my subsequent slides. So now I'll try to unpack these two, these two trends that I just talked about. So first is about how climate change migration is creating vulnerability to uh, slavery and trafficking. Now, in our research, we saw that it, you know, this, these three meet across at least three pathways. One in the aftermath of sudden disasters, like as I just mentioned, cyclones, floods, and, uh, and hurricanes, even heat waves. And we have seen that we have ample evidence which shows that trafficking increases in the aftermath of such incidents. Uh, for example, women left widowed after Cyclone Sidra in Bangladesh, they were targeted by traffickers uh, and they were forced into prostitution and hard labor. In Assam, traffickers, you know, hoarded around these temporary relief camps because people are in despair, they, they can't go back, they see their future in bleak. They, even though they know it's a risky migration opportunity, they still go with it. And many of these girls are forced into prostitution, child marriages, early marriages, and so on. The second pathway where we saw this nexus to exist was in the case of slow onset event, uh, and especially in case of drought, sea level rise, and erosion, where we saw, uh, for example, in, in, in Cambodia, where people are dependent on natural resources for their livelihood, when, you know, when they start facing uh, water stress, the crops start getting damaged, then they, you know, they typically go to survive they, or to make up for the crop loss. They go into that debt cycle, as I mentioned. And that debt cycle is so vicious. And, and because in Cambodia, we saw that this is such a massive infrastructure growth, many of these, uh, these farmers who take loan, they end up being in debt bondage within in, in these brickens, and then that intergenerational bondage. So it's not just not just end with one generation, it passes on generation after generation. And there's a research called Blood Bricks that maps intricate detail of how this uh, intergenerational debt bondage is existing in the brick kiln sector. And the third pathway is where conflict then 
it's, it's further exacerbates these, these two pathways, either in slow onset or rapid onset, when people are forced to undertake distress migration. Uh, they, you know, and, and where there are no strong institutions, there's no government machinery for support, then they get further exposed to this, uh, this trafficking and modern slavery. Now, these three pathways can intersect, overlap, but there are similar uh, dimensions that, that make people vulnerable to trafficking, and that is climate change uh, increases or worsens poverty and inequality, and that pushes people who are already in precarious condition in situations where they become vulnerable to trafficking. Now, I'll just present two quick case studies here. First is in from, and I picked up these two case studies because I know many of these journalists, many of you are from uh, Asia and Pacific region. So first is from Chitraput in India, where you know we have these traditional coal community which survives on forest for their livelihood. So they collect non-timber forest produce, they sell it in the market, or they undertake uh, uh, agriculture. And most of this agriculture is rain fed. So when there is drought-like situation or water stress or irregular rainfall, it leads to you know uh, destruction or damage of their crop or their forest produce is also going down because of the forest fires and so on. So men typically, it's you know if you look at the migration pattern, women and children are left behind uh, with elderly, and the men migrate. Uh, and then even the situation of men is not that great because those men typically work in stone mines, uh, stone crushing mines, and they constantly inhale fumes and dust, and that leads to long-term lung diseases. Many of them die at a very early age. But women who are left behind, you have to understand that the men don't start sending money back immediately. And so the women have to feed their family. And that leads to them taking debt from the local money lenders. And that creates that, you know, that leads, pushes them into this unending sexual abuse by the landowners. And, and, and the women who go along with their husbands, they're also not spared there because they are also, they call dadus and they get uh, sexually abused by them. Uh, and then water crisis further aggravates their vulnerability because they have to travel long distances, they have to they feed their family, they have to make sure that uh, their livelihood, there's food on the plate every day. So that's one situation. The second situation is from Urichar in Bangladesh, where we've seen that, you know, th those, you know, this area is exposed to frequent floods, cyclones, but also sea level, uh, uh, but also to coastal erosion. And every family that we, we interviewed here is exposed at least, has been displaced at least three, minimum three times to a maximum seven times. And what happens when, a, when, a, when, a, when the farmers see, or the people see their lands eroding, or their houses go, going, going down under the water, they rush to marry of their daughters. And that's a way of transferring their risks. So, so that the girl does not remain a burden on them, they, it becomes somebody else's burden. And what happens is mostly many of these girls that we interviewed, they are exposed to gender-based violence. So they are either because they don't have their support system anymore, they're being married to somewhere else. They force domestic abuse, sexual violence, sexual exploitation, and even men who are losing their livelihood, who are losing their house, they come back and the women, they take out their frustration on women and women become uh, victims of this domestic abuse, which was quite prevalent in that area. And if children have to lose school, uh, have to drop out from the school, it's mostly boys uh, who, who still put into boarding schools elsewhere, but it's the women, girls who are, uh, uh, who are, who have to leave school. But we also try to understand to what extent, because I, I talked about that slow onset and rapid onset. So we did this research I am because I wanted to bring in the other dimension. I've, I'll provide link to my research where you can see many of these drivers in more, more detail. Because it's climate change, what it's doing is it's acting as a stress multiplier to all the other vulnerabilities that people already faced. So there are development deficits in all this region in Asia, Pacific, uh, Africa. But there are institutional issues, there are social issues, there are education, literacy, and a whole lot of other issues that has led to marginalization of people. And on top of those development deficits, you have a new, new, new problem on the, around the block, and that is climate change. And that is increasing people's vulnerability. So we did this research in both slow onset and rapid onset event area. So for to understand the drivers of uh, forced displacement, distress migration, and how it creates vulnerability to trafficking. We picked up a Palamu region in, in India, which is exposed to drought. And then we picked up Kendrapada area in, in Odisha, 
which is exposed, you know, exposed to cyclones and floods, but also to sea level. So none of these areas are only exclusive to a slow onset or a rapid onset. These areas have one particular, uh, one or two uh, of climatic events pronounced. And what we saw uh, was the extent to trafficking was 42% in Palamo, like out of the total migrant undertaking distress migration, 42% were exposed to trafficking and 16% were exposed in, in rapid onset. By no means, 16% is less. 16% also is a very high number. But 42% is like a, it's something that should really make you jump up your chair and say, what is happening there? And it is happening because many of these families, they are in, from Palamo area, which is a very tribal dominated indigenous population. They have traditionally been neglected. Uh, then they are, uh, they, are, they are low in literacy. Uh, been marginalized for a very long time and they there were a particular group there uh, which is called pvtgs particularly vulnerable tribal group that's the way indian government uh, recognizes them and we saw that child trafficking was so rampant within them uh, girls were mostly young girls were being taken as domestic help forced labor and, and they were still i would say they were better off compared to those who were being taken away from prostitution, bearing children. So there's no better option. They're only worst option there. Uh, and, and the reason why, uh, you know, the, you know, one of the reason, like there were many reasons, but one of the reason why what we saw was leading to high trafficking rates in Palamo was because of, to a large extent, apathy of, uh, I would say, journalists because journalists typically cover rapid onset events. There is a heat wave, you cover it. There's a flood, there's a cyclone, you cover it in great detail. There's a drought, there's a sea level rise. Nobody cares about it, nobody covers it. And that does not, so when, when there are media articles that creates political pressure on the government to act on it, when there is no media pressure, these people are left to fend for themselves. There is no humanitarian assistance that reaches them. And on top of that, drought does not get declared. So the traditional, the typical benefit that they would get and the social protection program, that also does reach them. Uh, um, then I'll quickly talk about another issue, which I was in the field recently, and I that, you know, I still have that research data coming out. So if you have, like, if you keep following, you'll see more data around it. But I'll quickly talk about some of the, other uh, issues like when climate change happens and people have to undertake distress migration, those who stay behind as well as those who are forced to move, they are both exposed to sexual and gender based violence, but then it's also creating health, sanitation, mental health, physical health, anxiety. So when, you know, people like us, we, you know, we still have our sustained livelihood, protected livelihood. These people who are exposed to these like one crop loss, other crop loss, and they can see that the it's continuing one after the other after the other, that recurring disaster or recurring uh, issue in the life that creates mental anxiety, a sense of despair. And that is pushing people into undertaking like, for example, in, you know, I know uh, journalists here are not from, uh, from Africa, but I wanted to hi highlight these two uh, cases. Where in, in Turkana County in Kenya, they are typically pastoralists. And they they you know, they it's instead of undertaking migration, and they are typical migrant communities, so they love doing that. Be but because there's increase in mortality of their livestock, these uh, migrant community have to now undertake settled life. And, and, and that is leading to increase in alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, both in men and women. And when women undertake, you know, they, you know, they, because of this drug abuse, they are more exposed to gender and sexual violence. Um, and similarly, we also saw in Uganda, uh, where because this migration is increasing, many of these in informal settlements or relief camps, they're getting crowded, which means that, yeah, and, and these girls who are in these camps, and this is something we saw uh, even in, uh, in Bangladesh and in Assam, uh, in relief camps, if they are not because of climate change, but in Rohingya camps, you can see that young girls, uh, they, they, it leads to teenage pregnancy, early marriages in these camps. And, and this is something that we need to highlight. Of course, in, in, in Rohingya camps, this is not because of climate change. But, you know, this is a typical issue when climate is further driving these migration, 
then it leads to all these issues for women and girls. And because I highlighted Chitrakoot example earlier, you know, even in Chitrakoot, what we saw that the women and girls were left behind, you know, and because of these multiple drought spells, they have to walk several kilometers every day. Three to four are wasted in, uh, in just going and collecting water from these tankers, which means because of lack of water, one, uh, girls have to forego schools. Two, because there's limited water, their menstrual hygiene is getting impacted. Uh, they are becoming prone to diseases. You could see if you look at their, uh, uh, their health parameters, the weight, you know, we have data around that, the weight has deteriorated. And I was recently in Bangladesh, like a few weeks back, where we've seen, you know, I, I still have data coming in and we are still analyzing it. It's because women there, they, they are coastal areas where salinity is increasing. So every time there's a cyclone, the seawater comes and uh, contaminate, uh, and it, it covers the agricultural land and then that penetrates into groundwater and leads to salination. So women, especially when they, and they have low, no option. So either they travel four kilometers every day, five kilometers every day, bring that water, which is uh, very limited for cooking, drinking, everything. Many women have started drinking that saline water, which means that is impacting their reproductive health uh, and leading to all sorts of other uh, intestinal and other uh, problems for them. So, you know, these are issues which we qualify as non-economic, right? But then even though we call it non-economic, people, it's something which is far more profound. You go and talk to these people, they, the first thing they want treated is, you know, how can we help them deal with that issue of uh, drinking water? So we also try to understand, you know, what are the drivers of, uh, you know, this distress migration? How can we really help? So we wanted to understand what is, like, we, we saw that whenever there is an occurrence of loss and damage caused because of climate impacts, it increases the odds of distress migration in slow and rapid onset event. And you can say, in rapid onset event is much higher, 687% compared to 172, because in rapid onset, they can they see that their houses, their, their land, everything is destroyed immediately. So they take immediate decision to move. But in slow onset, it comes slowly. Similarly, in case of social protection, people who have access to job cards, public works, where their livelihood is secured, it reduces the odds of migration. Uh, and where people have, uh, have access to food subsidy, food security, then again, it reduces odds of migration and similarly monthly income. I'm not going to take you through all this detail because I know time is limited, but you know, we really, and the one thing that really stood out was people who are marginalized, people who are marginalized because of their caste, that increased the migration because for them, the climate impacts was much more pronounced than those who are not marginalized because of us. So these are the things that we really need to unpack and understand. We've tried to come out with some data around it. And what happens is, you know, when you don't, when you don't support people who are pushed into this distress migration, and these are non-economic loss and damage, then there's a cost of inaction. It leads to secondary and then tertiary impact. Secondary impact in the forms of distress migration, forced displacement, and tertiary impact in terms of making them vulnerable to trafficking. Now, right now, we have not, people don't understand that in monetary value, so it is not creating that pressure for, uh, for the government, but it will become more profound in the coming times. And what action do we really need? We really need to provide support to communities before, during, and after migration. Uh, we need to provide comprehensive social protection system, which is rights-based, uh, it's portable. So even when people are moving, uh, they have that support system with them. It should be anticipatory. So the support should be provided to them on the basis of early warning system before a crisis strikes them and not after that. Uh, we need a robust information system. Um, and then again, we need migration advisory and helpline service, something that we have done in Jharkhand uh, with our partners, uh, FIA Foundation there, who are running a migration helpline. It's almost acting like a embassy for migrants, but these are like very small uh, in, uh, small efforts that are being done by some NGOs. It has to be much more uh, uh, large scale. And then finally, people need, people should be taken towards opportunity and not distress. So people need support at the destination site to get them safe, uh, decent jobs, uh, which provide, you know, with dignity and, and places where they can stay, uh, they, they have health facility, health coverage, and so on. 
So I'll stop there. These are some of the resources uh, on the basis of which I talk and I'll share it with Ariane and she can pass it on if need be. So with that, I'll stop there, Ariane. Um, I know I probably bend beyond my time. So back to you. Definitely, um, definitely worked um, out though. We really need those information to end. Gladly extending that time was very crucial. There's so many um, issues that women experience. Imagine that 80 million um, that will be affected worldwide by displacement. And Rito is already sharing the experiences. Imagine 42% of women are trafficked that are from displacement. You can see that impact already. So we really need to look into as journalists ways where we can report about not just rapid onset, but the impact of climate change. Um, not just the one that goes right away, but the longer term so that we can slowly bring that political pressure for change, for reform and transformation so that we can truly support women. With that, we had several questions um, that is being um, asked. I'll go first from the end. Um, so for journalists, how can they cover the less visible aspect of climate change, especially when it comes to gender-based violence? So that's for Ritu. Yes, uh, yeah. so what we really need to understand is, uh, you know, typically gender-based violence, again, can be in many ways. I was look, reading one of the other questions around sale of kidney, and it really, you know, it, it, it impacts you at a different level. You just don't understand the apathy uh, um, what the way you could cover this is by doing more of uh, uh, in-depth case study assessment, because right now the big problem with non-economic loss and damage, and we typically qualify it as that, there are no standardized methodology. Uh, but what, you know, we, we are trying to come up with a different value-based judgment. And, and that's something that we, 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 I was in the field about, where we, like, there are certain things that government gives value to. You know, government gives value to, oh, you know, this, this road has been destroyed by climate change, or this, this infrastructure has been destroyed, or this, these, these many houses have been destroyed. Let's provide uh, compensation for that. But what's not being provided compensation is for all those other factors. Women drinking saline water, it's impacting their reproductive system. They, you know, they had a dream to like, you know, those women that I just interviewed, they said they wanted to have children, babies. Now I don't think they can have babies. So for them, what the only way you can go and get out some of these information is to do case study assessment, go and talk to these, tell their stories, individual stories. And when these stories and that story, you know, one thing that I've also seen policymakers brush aside, ah, oh, that's a that's a stray incident. Like, you know, these are case studies. So you do need to come out with numbers as well. So let's start because we are trying to bring together a community of practitioners. And you know, so we're calling it you know, Loss and Damage Research Observatory, where you're bringing together many of these researchers together to come out with that value-based judgment. So how much does a community, a woman or a girl, assigns value to that particular safety net that is broken for them, that's been destroyed for them. And then once you start assigning value to them, then we'll start, be, then we'll be able to monetize them. And we also need to understand, again, you know, we try to do some of that cost of inaction, that how much will that lead to? And, and that's, that's on us, we need to give you with more data around it, is the economic assessment. That if, a, if there is breakdown in health system, so there's another research that I'm going to be coming out very recently, very quickly, is around how would, how does climate change crop loss is leading to suicides? To what extent is leading to suicides? And when you and to what extent social safety net is important to prevent that suicide? So you know you're losing one adult life and one adult productive life, and you know you have to quantify that loss of life. Surprisingly, is a non-economic loss and damage. So you know you have to understand loss of life is not considered economic loss. So you know you we basically need to do more of these uh, storylines come out with from a range of regions saying that this is not one particular area, it is a general trend, it's happening everywhere. And we need to come up with more of those value-based judgments, standardized methodologies to quantify those non-economic losses and damages. So back to Thank you. Thank you for Ariane. that. Thank you for that, Rita. Definitely the numbers. We will provide you the presentation of both of our speakers, which has resources. 
bringing in numbers. That's how we talk to the government. That's how we talk to um, the population to give that value, to understand the value. Because sometimes you say 4 million, 4 billion loss. So we never account for such things as gender-based violence and the impact of that to women. So I think that this is a greater way for um, journalists to bring that in. Another question, and this goes for both DG and we too. Um, so our attendees shared an experience where women have in India has been sell selling their kidneys and they're also like good practices on how they you know, cope by using WhatsApp, by using technology to sell fish. But the question that she, that she or he wants to share is how can we influence government to change their policies in favor of looking at the experience of the marginalized communities, women, and all of that? I can come in, DG. I'll just very quickly come. You know, we recently did this research separately on this mental health and physical health. And what we are really being pushing government is to do anticipatory response. So typically what happens is, you know, you start providing relief measures. It's always reactive. It is never proactive. And, you know, these women, and we also need to provide more protection cover. So insurance cover so that when people are exposed to health impacts or, uh, you know, health impact comes later, when they see the loss of, uh, the lives, livelihood, infrastructure, property, you know, they're selling kidney to make up for that debt law, that debt cycle on which they are being pushed into. But if you provide insurance cover, uh, insurance is not the solution here, by the way, but you need to provide insurance cover to cover for some of that loss and damage. And that insurance cover should cover them in anticipatory manner, not pro post facto. And, you know, and, and the other thing that we are trying to push government is to provide social safety net, again, based on anticipatory uh, action and not after the uh, after the event has occurred. So back to you, DG. Yes, I'm glad that really to mentioned anticipatory action because in my previous work with the Food and Agriculture Organization, we um, uh, implemented an anticipatory action for rural women um, against drought. So that was the 2018-2019 El Nino, and it was successful. So I think how we can influence governments to change their policies is to cover these types of stories, because these can serve as like a pilot for governments to, to see that these kinds of interventions are indeed um, successful and they are beneficial, especially to the poor. And it also helped that Ritu mentioned social protection because um, the main goal of anticipatory action is to provide a safety net for um, vulnerable sectors, especially women. So just to um, reiterate to my answer to one of the questions that also mentioned um, anticipatory action. Before in um, FAO, we called it early warning, early action. And then we shifted to anticipatory action to, you know, um, align it with the vision of other organizations. So what happened was, um, because drought is a slow onset disaster that is easily monitored, like the 2018-2019 El Nino was already foreseen um, by July 2017. So the uh, Pag-asa, the Weather Bureau of the Philippines already issued warnings that an El Nino was impending. And um, that was what we call um, the window of opportunity to provide the rural women with um, interventions such as provision of alternative livelihoods. So we provided them with mallard ducks that will provide um, additional income and also source of food in case there's no food because there's no income. <laughs> and um, we also provided tools because as I mentioned earlier, women are not really the owners of tools or equipment. So because of that intervention, um, the households of the women who uh, benefited from the project did not experience hunger. Um, there, uh, we didn't measure if there was gender-based violence, but um, it wasn't mentioned when we returned. Uh, but I think that could help lessen. And there. So the investment we made 
50 pesos or a dollar for each household gained four dollars of profit so it if we highlight stories like that it would sway policymakers into thinking that um, these types of projects can be translated into um, we can scale it up to government programs and you know create policies that would allow for um, disaster financing or climate financing at the national level because we did it at a community level only. So one of the main um, results of that anticipatory action we did was we were able to um, influence policy at the regional level. So the Bangsamoro government already had has a, an anticipatory technical working group that you know manages the disaster financing and of course we can also include climate financing so that's it thank you yeah. i'm learning a lot so really put, putting in the forefront that concept that term anticipatory response so that actions are in anticipation of future climate change actions as journalists an invitation to bring out that word bring those terminologies out so that our policymakers begin to be aware and really specify solutions. And maybe the social protection is just a response and maybe later on we'll have better solutions coming forward. But really documenting solutions are one way to go. And that is something that we want, we want to highlight with our journalists. So very short now, um, I just have two more questions. Um, so how can women business leaders um, influence women and the community to turn their sense of awareness, especially on climate change, into action. What are ways to influence women and their communities? I um, will start with DJ. Okay. So um, let me read the question again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how can we encourage um, communities to effectively turn, turn their away. sense of awareness into action? I'm just gathering my thoughts. Ritu, go ahead. I can quickly come in uh, because <laughs> yes. I have yes. to yes. drop off in two minutes. Uh, so basically, you know, I was in India recently uh, for the field trip and I was amazed. One, uh, the internet, mobile data penetration. So almost every girl knew how to use WhatsApp and they, they are surfing internet. So what these women leaders can really do, business leaders can really do is become agents of change, inspire women, come out with the way in which, uh, in which they are, you know, within their own, because these women, these girls, they do idealize these business leaders, uh, women who are successful, not just business, all, all leaders around them, any woman that they see successful around them, they want to idealize them, they want to emulate them and follow them. So probably they need to reach out more with their stories of how from very humble background, they have grown and become uh, and reached that stage and probably inspire these women to come up to. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you for you. the savory too. <laughs> <laughs> So um, thank you for that. I'll just um, provide um, a more, you know, concrete example of what Rita said. So there was a question on who was or who are Sigay no mga babay, the um, all women group I mentioned earlier. So as Rita said, to empower women is to set an example. So these women in Sigay ng mga babay are women who set an example by action. So um, in the Muslim community, usually uh, women are meek. They are not as, um, they do not have a strong voice. Um, usually, at least in the communities I have worked with, I'm not generalizing, but in, in my experience, in the communities I've worked with, um, they are not as vocal. But with the women of Sigay ng mga babay, they were, um, their actions were speaking louder than their words were. So I think giving women the voice through, you know, providing um, a solid example of empowerment is um, can also be uh, an effective way to turn awareness into action. I hope I answered. 
the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DG. Um, Ritu is dropping off now. Um, she is in another meeting. Um, there are several questions that are still here, but let me just go through one of them. Um, how do you pitch to editors if you want to link health with climate change? I will go back to Ritu's answer. Let's find data. Let's find ways to also quantify it because when numbers show up, it will be easier to pitch that to your editor. So one way that Ritu was suggesting to join this group that she's setting up on a research on climate change and as well as health. Um, then um, I do want to just close this session one more time by asking DG a story that is inspiring of women, which also aligns to Rosa's question. What are the ways women have become resilient in times of climate change? DG? Okay, so, um, you know, we Filipinos have always been told that we're resilient, that we easily bounce back, but um, I think that's the superficial view of resilience. I think the deeper kind of resilience is the one I have seen from the women I have worked with because they understood what resilience is all about. It's not just bouncing back, but as the Sendai framework said, you should bounce back and build back better. So uh, um, I find it, I found it inspiring that um, despite these women not knowing about what the Sendai framework is, they were living it, um, they were living it. <laughs> and their actions um, were able to help them rise up from, from you know, the different, different types of hazards that they were experiencing like i would i always refer to sigay no mga babay because they are like the prime example of um an empowered women uh, an empowered woman so um as i said they have been uh, internally displaced for the longest time since the all out war of president estrada in 2000 the year 2000 um they have been experiencing flooding, um, several firefights between non-state armed groups and the Philippine army. And yet they were able to form a group uh, that was all women. They were able to set up a social enterprise. They were able to provide um, additional income to their households through their vegetable gardens and um, recently during the recent um, typhoon that struck them they were able to help um, their immediate communities so i think um, yeah, with a story of resilience indeed yeah right? we'll have so they were able to rise up yeah, with this women soon. So we will um, be sharing that also, um, working with the women from that organization. Thank you. Thank you, DG, for sharing that story of resilience. As we end this session, the idea challenge, the inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility challenge, especially for this first um, web talk, is to include women and their stories. As we bring to weave, as we bring in the perspective and weave the stories of women in the mainstream stories, we allow the opportunity for them to tell their stories in their own voice and their experience. This then enriches the entire narratives that we live by in our lives and in their lives. And in the future, should we continue to allow women and their voices to be heard, we not only shape communities, our world, but for the next generation of women to come. And that's our time for today. Thank you everyone for joining this webinar. And as a reminder, we will be sending you the link to the webinar recording with via email in a couple of days. And that includes our speakers' presentations with all the resources linked that they have. We would also like to ask you to please fill out the survey in the chat so that we can have a feedback and how we can make this session even better. Thank you again for joining and have a great day.